Welcome to episode 141 of Auto Off Topic. What's going on, Andrew? What's up, Brad? Not too much. We have a topic tonight. We do have a topic. Do you want to get right into it, or do we have anything else to catch up on first? No, we'll get right into it. Okay, excellent. Uh, we're going to talk about something that's had a major influence on vehicle design and can make or break a car. I In think design so. wise? Yeah, design wise. Yeah, now it can. You used to not be able to because it was so regulated. <laughs> well, it kind of dictated how a car was designed. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and this is headlight history of headlight regulations in the United States. Yeah. Because it's very specific to the United States. Yeah, there was a time period where every vehicle sold here had very similar headlights because the government said so. Mm-hmm. So everywhere else in the world, a car would be designed around a certain style of headlight. And then the vehicle sold here would have like... A blanking plate in its place with a round headlight in it. Yeah, a retrofit. Yep. So it's super annoying. It made some cars really ugly. Like my NSU, actually. Yeah. It's supposed to have oval headlights. Hmm. And it has round headlights, and it looks weird because the car was designed around oval headlights. Ah. In fact, if you take the headlight bezels off, there's a giant ovular opening in the front of the fender. And it just has this silver panel that blocks it all with a round headlight in it. Huh. So... Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, of course, headlights are a vital feature to the function of a car and a major design point, I think. Yeah, no. I mean, they're only vital if you want to drive at night, though. Right. Yeah. Um, the for, fir- so pretty the, important. Yeah, so the first headlights, and I'm going to use headlights and headlamps interchangeably. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. I'll say it. We're not talking about, way. like, miners' headlights, headlamps. On well, that's helmets. the thing. So, the first ones on a car were acetylene apparently this is a it's like a carbide filament or and oil powered so acetylene like the fuel yeah like acetylene torch so the technology was originally used for miners oh uh, was it really and likely the term where headlight or headlamp comes from so if you think of an old-timey miner with that headlight yeah thing, i was not even i was like joking yeah. like i didn't realize that was like, actually a thing we were going to talk about literally a headlight so they dripped water on a calcium carbide uh like filament, and it produced acetylene gas, and then it was burned for light. This seems way complicated. Yeah. So these lights had to be cleaned a lot because lime is a byproduct of the burning process and would build up on the inside of the lens. And just make it foggy. Yeah. Were and these the first headlamps, or yeah. weren't originally they just like literally like candles with reflectors in them? Probably candles with reflectors, but yeah. like the first more practical ones were these. I mean, this is literally at the, this is like the turn of the 19th century. Yeah, brass era cars. Because, I mean, cars were only around, like, in practicality from, like, 1890-something and on. Yeah, and they weren't even commonplace until the 1900s. Yeah, so. and anything before 1890, I don't think it had headlights or you... you there was w- certainly no standard design. It wasn't yet. really a car. It was, like, a motorized buggy. Yeah. Even the stuff in the 1890s and early 1900s wasn't much beyond yeah. that. I mean, we were just talking a couple episodes ago about going to the museum in Cleveland and seeing the, you know, turn of the century cars and how quickly the car evolved in the first, you know, 15, 20 years of its life. Yeah. So not only was that light output weak, the water in them could freeze in cold weather. Of course. Or rain and wind would extinguish the flame. So think about it. Like, hold on a second. I have to go ignite my headlights with a match. And uh, so this style was commonly used up to 1912. Was it that late, huh? Yeah. Wow. Um, so I assume towards the end they were better, much like anything else. Like they were maybe. easier to light, stayed lit longer. Maybe. I mean, I don't have much experience with brass era cars. No. And I think, honestly, probably a lot of them that get used with any kind of regularity today probably has some kind of electrical, you know, light change in them. I don't think... You'd even drive a brass era car at night, really. I mean, I would. Unless it's some, like, special thing. Yeah. Because a lot of these cars only had headlights. They didn't even have brake lights or taillights. Right. It was literally just headlights. Again, something that you would retrofit if you're going to use yeah. a car in any yeah, kind yeah. of regularity nowadays. And there are people that still drive brass era cars. I mean, they don't daily drive them by any means, by any means but they certainly use them. You know, and if I had enough money to have one and a place to keep it and have everything else I already wanted, I would... Would totally drive one. Yeah, I, I mean, it would be a neat little, like, thing to own. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I haven't seen one outside of a museum or a concourse, maybe a parade. So the earliest car we've seen recently just driving was that Packard, the blue, like, 28 Packard. Yeah. 
with being driven. We start being driven from Brookline, Mass to Boston, Mass. Mm-hmm. So, but that car would be late enough that it have electric headlights mm-hmm. and brake lights. Mm-hmm. And again, that car I think had some modern, more modern, like as in like nineteen twenties modern <laughs> touches added to it. So they actually had electric headlights. Uh, the first ones debuted in eighteen ninety eight. So they did have them on electric cars or a gasoline car. Gasoline cars, okay. but they took too much power to run and therefore didn't make it into vehicles. Okay, that makes sense. It like, took more power than like the vehicle's voltage system Could put out. out yeah. yeah. So you had to have auxiliary batteries. Actually, did they even have a voltage system on some of the early cars? They had like a magneto, an ignition. There wasn't some kind of battery. It was kind of like the way a motorcycle is. We don't really have an alternator. Okay. Um, it just sort of, the engine just generates its own electricity and it just keeps it running. Right, because you didn't really have like electric start. Know. No, definitely didn't. You had to hand crank. Yeah, you hand cranked them. So think about like a motorcycle. You kick start it, and then it just kind of runs. Because it's running, it's like a magneto, and it just keeps it enough power to yeah. run spark, and not much else. Maybe that just a single headlight on a motorcycle, single tail light. I mean, modern motorcycles are a little different, but yeah. Yeah, they have like an actual battery, but you know, early motorcycles like that didn't really, or like I... So much like early cars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing at the end of the day here. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that much different. But then in 1904, the Puckley Automobile Electric Lighting Syndicate, like it's a gang or something, uh, offered lights powered by an 8-volt battery. And that was, uh, like, it was a full retrofit kit. So you could buy that. It was an aftermarket, like, kit. You'd buy it. have headlights, taillights, hmm. turn signals. I wonder if people complained about the super bright 8-fold headlights. Like, we complain <laughs> about HID retrofits nowadays. Yeah. Oh, my God. These LEDs, they don't work with my flashers. Yeah. Um, so because of those shortcomings, electric lights became... Uh, uh, they weren't as common until after 1912... Uh, when Cadillac introduced their Delco electrical ignition and lighting systems. Okay, a so, name we're still familiar with today, obviously. Yeah, so Cadillac was one of the early innovators of technology. Yeah, um, it, and they were right into the 50s and 60s. They were always yeah, ahead of the curve. Because they were the premier line for GM. They so were they, the standard of the world. Yeah, so they debuted a lot of technology. And obviously, like one of the early things was standardized controls that we know today. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously... I didn't know about that they came up with electric headlights. And uh, they also had um, lights that could be switched on from the cabin. That was one of their first things, too. Instead of having to go outside the car and turn them on? Mm-hmm. And so then at this time, even still, so early headlights were mostly proprietary to the design of the car. So servicing them, I imagine, was kind of a nightmare. Like you had to get go to the whoever made the car, whoever made the lighting system to get the lights. Okay. So like your NSU had oval headlights. Mm-hmm. All right. In Europe. In Europe. But like you probably, even if you were in Europe, you probably couldn't go like everywhere and get that headlight. So by that point, the headlight was a replaceable bulb in the back, like an H3 style. Yeah. So it's different. So we'll get into composite headlights. Yeah. But imagine that being like an, just a sealed oval headlight. Like right. what is this weird sealed oval headlight? Right. Yeah, it wasn't, it's not that. But So that that's a thing. So then uh, there were no laws requiring, requiring headlights until our home state of Massachusetts became the first state to require electric headlights God on damn, cars. Goddamn nanny state. In 1915. <laughs> they required electric headlights? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. 1915 seems early, too, to require them. Yeah, I don't know. But Especially since in 1915, most cars, a lot of cars still weren't coming with them. Yeah. If Cadillac only introduced it in 1912 as a standard thing. Maybe your dealer had to install them as an aftermarket. Yeah. I mean, there's always been an aftermarket industry for cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ever since day one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then by the 20s, more states required headlamps, and in 21, this is when it was finally federally mandated that automotive headlights had to be put had to put out a specific amount of light and have a focus beam to not blind drivers. Uh-huh. So you could have all these aftermarket lights, and you're right, they could blind people. They yeah. probably, People would be complaining about them. Yeah. Some things never change. Yeah. Those distracted drivers sending smoke signals. Yeah, exactly. Instead of cell phones. 
And they're so, blinding headlights that you can't see past because they're not regulated. Yeah, and they're just like aimed everywhere and just... Yeah. And the other thing too, if they're not paying attention to like the beam focus, it's literally just like... A pencil beam straight to the eyes of somebody coming at you. Or it's like a household light. Oh, that's true too. Like it's just a room light yeah. which just goes everywhere and doesn't do much of anything. It must have been pretty hairy driving like an early, early car at night. Well, the good news is they weren't very fast. This is true. But they also didn't have very good brakes. Nope. So. And you have to admit, you probably like outside of a major downtown area in a city. There's no lights. There's no lights. Yeah, there was no. There's no street lights, nothing. Yeah, there was no infrastructure. There's no reflective street signs. There's no reflective signposts. There's no, like, probably, I don't know, we'll have to look look at another episode about this, but when did they paint lines on streets? There probably wasn't even that. That's a good, yeah. Yeah. Don't look that up. But, and if they did, it definitely wasn't reflective. They didn't, no, have, they didn't have those little things that like go bump, like they the oh, center line ones. The center line ones that you uh, hit when you're changing lanes on the highway. And then, of course, so prior to 1931, 1939, headlight design was still not standardized. And this is when the venerable seven-inch round sealed beam. What year was this? 1939. Okay, because I'm looking. I just looked real quick to see about road lines. Yeah. And apparently, um, painted road lines date back to 1918, but only in the UK. Mm. And marking of roads wasn't a standardized practice until the mid-20s. Whew. So all these cars with no headlights and no marks in the roads. I, I know that is definitely a thing. And a lot of the roads probably weren't paved, so there's no, de- no deviation between like the road and the field. <laughs> yeah, we'll have <laughs> to look into that. That's a good idea. This is a little behind the scenes, but we'll talk yeah. about that. Because I know off the top of my head that... Uh, I believe highway signage was not standardized until the interstate was invented. Probably I think not. I'm it's talking probably, about, probably no reason for it. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing that, and I feel like I'm kind of right about that. But I'll have to look it up because I every up until that point, up until the interstates were were invented, we're going to go off topic real quick. Interstates came from or after World War II. They were inspired by Germany's Autobahn, mm-hmm. Eisenhower. They're called the Eisenhower, Eisenhower interstate, interstate system, interstate yep. system because he realized that Germany could quickly mobilized during the war and move troops around and that's what he copied the interstate system that's what it's for it's it's out of the cold war era yeah I, just but that quick, would be it on its own interesting yeah real quickly too. in that it looks like 50s is when that mm-hmm. came into play and 50s is when there was mo- it wasn't until the 50s that there were more lines than just lines that marked the edges of the road right so 39 uh the federal so the seven inch round sealed beam headlight was invented in 36 and then mandated by 1940 because in 1939, again, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108 was passed. And it said all vehicles sold in the U.S. were required to have two 7-inch diameter round sealed beam headlights. Right. And that's that way for a long time after that. Yep. But let's talk about um, what a sealed beam is. Sure. So that's exactly s- what, it, what, it, what it is. It's a beam that's the bulb is sealed inside the mm-hmm. unit. So it's a replaceable headlight. Yeah. So everyone who's into cars has probably seen one. And it's literally, it's a seven inch round piece of glass, like a seven inch round glass bulb. It's like a mm-hmm. fancier version of the incandescent bulb that you screw into a light bulb. Yep. Except instead of having screws, like a screw it's thread at the back. Screws in the, around the edge. It's got three prongs yep. to plug in the electrical connector. And then... And then you have a bracket that goes over it with screws around the edge to hold it in place. Yeah. Uh, Depending it, on the It car. just has way thicker glass to resist breaking. Yep. And it's, um, it's a fluted glass to yeah. like throw the beam in the correct direction. Yeah. It's got a high beam, low beam, tungsten filament lens reflector, and metal terminals, and it's all vacuum sealed together. Right. And then, of course, like you said, the pattern molded into the glass and integrated reflector help with focusing the beam of light. Correct. So this jump to standardization in 3940, I think, was pretty forward thinking. Yeah. I mean, think about certain things that would be crazy annoying if not standardized. Well, it would be hard, like they said in the earlier cars, it was a pain to service them because every car is proprietary. Yeah. So you couldn't just like pop into AutoZone and get your replacement bulb. Like power plugs for small electronics mm-hmm. before USB came out, mm-hmm. they were just all their own thing. Right. So you always had to find the exact yeah. plug for that particular electric device you were using. There's like three or four different versions of USB right now, but still almost everybody has extra USB cables hanging right. around and you just plug stuff in and, and the U- charges. And the, and the large USB end is usually universal. It's the, yeah. th- there's three or four different ones that go into the device now, which is fine. I mean, it's not fine, but it's fine. I remember being a kid and having, 
like electronic games. Yeah, to find the right adapter and to plug it in the wall. If you lost the adapter, you might as well have thrown the game away because there wasn't a universal thing you could go to the store and buy another one of. So. No, it was super annoying. Um, so, and then can you imagine this? Like, they hadn't standardized the seven inch round back then. Mm-hmm. Like trying to find an NOS or replica headlight for an old car that wasn't a popular model. Be impossible. Be impossible. Yeah. Like what? What would you do with it? Like you're that. Like, what do we talk about? That Cleveland motor car that we saw at the Cleveland Museum? Yep. That probably had 7-inch round headlights? No, because it was pre-39. Oh, it was pre-39. Yeah, that would have okay. giant, like, huge things on it. All right. But, like, a, an obscure 30s car. Yeah, it wouldn't be. Yeah. You had to have it made, pretty much. There's no... Yeah, it would be crazy. And again, we're talking because it's, it's a it's a wearable item. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a, part that, it's a part that burns out, whereas later cars have a proprietary design for the headlight, but the bulb is not. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, you're right. It's it was definitely a definitely a godsend at that point because if you if you had like every car design had its own sealed beam, that would be almost impossible to replace. Yeah, so it limited car design, but it eliminated a lot of issues. And to this day, a basic halogen bulb, seven inch round one, is like ten to fifteen bucks. Right, like they're still pretty inexpensive. And I think the I, I'm trying to think real quick in my head what vehicles still come with a standard sealed beam bulb. And I think like a base model F two fifty, F three fifty, and E two fifty, E three fifty van are probably it. I, I have some trivia for you at the end. Oh, okay. And you'll uh, you'll find out. So then, in nineteen fifty seven, federal law was amended, and vehicles were allowed to have. So think about that from thirty nine to fifty seven. Okay. Every vehicle sold in the U.S. has same seven inch round headlights. Yeah. So same twenty year span there almost. Yeah, was, right. That's crazy. Yeah, but convenient. It is. Um, Although at that point there was probably still a mix of six and twelve volt in there though. Yes. So. But. All the same headlights. Yep. Um, and then so fifty seven the federal law was amended and vehicles were allowed to have separate low and high beam lights, which okay. would be the four sealed beam headlight system. Well, that explains, like, 1958 General Motors cars. Yep. Because they immediately adopted this new system. And Chryslers and yep. Fords. Because um, it was like, oh, we can play with the design now. Yeah, right? so they, they immediately they, did. They lobbied because they wanted to open up different style of design. Okay. Um, and But these aren't 7-inch headlights. These are 5 and 3 quarter inch. Still sealed beam style. Still sealed beam style. Right. So two are low beam, two are the high beam. Uh yeah, and that's where we start to see the the dual headlight designs of the late 50s through the 60s. Correct. And that's where, I mean, a lot of iconic cars out of the 60s have the dual headlights. Especially the Chrysler's with their, like, canted headlight design where they're, the high beams and the low beams are not next to each other. They're, like, at an angle from each other. Yeah, they're not vertical. They're not horizontal. They're, like, yeah. angled. Like a V. <laughs> yeah, they look pretty cool. And then even, like, uh, the early, like, the 64 Tempest Le Mans GTO... They have the stacked headlights. Well, it had horizontal at first, right? In the nope. 64? Mm, yes. Yes, it did. Yep. And then when they went vertical, that was like yeah. iconic. Like, I think that was what changed them. Like, I think they're... The 64 is like an okay looking car to me. Yeah, 66 and 7 is... Yeah. I really know. The Coke bottle style sides and the vertical headlights. Just super cool. And then it doesn't happen till the 60s. When we see a new type of sealed headlight beam technology, so Italian automakers came out with a halogen sealed beam. So that wasn't until the '60s. Okay, but they That's weren't. That's what we have now, though. Yeah, like standard, pretty much as far as yeah sealed beam cars. But it didn't come out until the '60s. Huh. So S- what was the difference between the halogen and what were the other ones? They're just. Uh, so they're they're pretty much still the standard for sealed beams. So incandescent light tech hasn't changed much. Um, right. You can buy some brighter sealed beams, um, but basically they used a um, they used halogen gas to re- react with the filament and provide a better light output. As opposed to what were the original ones? They were just like tungsten in there. Oh, okay. And they just I, under a vacuum, and I think they just they changed the gas mixture inside of them. Okay. And that's what makes them brighter put more power to it. Or yeah, because the way a, a light bulb works, the inside of it can't have oxygen because it will burn the filament out. Mm-hmm. So it operates in a vacuum so you don't have that extra bit to combust. Because that's why if you've got like a... If the vacuum fails on a bulb, that's 
the vacuum seal. Like that's usually why they'll burn out. Okay. Because yeah, the oxygen will literally cause it to catch on fire and then it just burns out the filament. Okay. Eventually they wear out and they burn out anyways, but that's how it happens. That's why I'll never see a sealed beam headlight with a cracked lens working very well. No. <laughs> Or, or, or a lens or crack that goes all the way through. Or not, and it won't work for very long. Right. Um, so they have this halogen technology in Europe, but it didn't become common in the U.S. till about 78 and 79. Hmm. So, uh, and then, so from 57 to 74, at the request of the U.S. automakers, the federal highway laws were amended again. So cars designs could feature rectangular headlights. That was in 74. 74. Yeah, but they were still steel beam headlights at this point. They exactly. were not anything beyond that. Yep. And I can't think of any 74s that have square headlights. Nope, because it was by 1975. Maybe 75 they started, yeah. So it was amended in 74 for the 75 model year. Okay. Which is why we were talking about, I posted a picture on Instagram, my grandfather's 75 Cadillac, that was like it the first square. year that has four square headlights. Okay, yep. Um. So I was thinking in my brain, I wasn't thinking of the Cadillac, I was thinking like Buick Electra went to four square headlights in 75. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a few cars. They were like, oh, this is the 70s. We're doing squares. (laughs) Um, Or it just sounds like just like in 1957 when they were like, oh, in 58 we can do something different. Exactly. We're going to do it. (laughs) Like, we're allowed, so it's Mm -hmm. going to happen. I'm thinking of like... Like a 72 Monte Carlo, that giant boat just still has two round headlights on it. Yeah, it's got two full 7-inch headlights on it, yeah. And then later on, it probably went to squares, right? The car was totally redesigned, though, first. But yes. So the interesting thing about the square headlights is that they went to, for a single headlight system, so the high-low is in the same bulb. Right. Those are 200 millimeters. And the interesting thing is that they switched to metric measurement for them. Well, that was a weird time in America anyway for metric measurements. Yeah, because they were starting to switch over a lot of vehicles from standard to metric. I looked up a picture of a 74 Eldorado because I couldn't in my brain picture it. Mm -hmm. So I was picturing like two big seven inch round, but doesn't. It has two of the five and a quarter inch round ones per side in a square housing. (laughs) Because they were getting ready for it. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, And then you could have the four headlight system with separate low and high beams. Which used 165 millimeter headlights. Oh, that looks goofy. Right? The square ones look so much better because the car is so square. Yeah. I'm thinking of like a Volvo 240 where the early ones had 7-inch rounds. Yep. Then mid-refresh ones had dual squares. Mm-hmm. And then the later ones had composites. Like right. the very last like few years had yeah, composites. Yeah, like 90, 93. The giant like television screens. Yes. Um. So, yeah, of course, the switch to the metric was a sign of the changing times, and rectangle lights were permitted, but not required. But by the end of the 70s, most American cars, would you say, had square headlights? I'd say most of them. Yeah. I mean, some sports cars didn't. Like uh, Corvettes it, probably still used... Well, they were pop-ups. So yeah. They were round pop-ups until the 84s. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Camaros and stuff until the third gen came out, so 80, 81, 82, mm-hmm. Camaros still had round headlights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and then uh, another about 10 years go by. It wasn't until 1983, uh, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108 was amended again to allow composite headlight assemblies. And what year was that? 1983. Wow. Do you know what the first U.S. car was to use composite headlights? Oh, um, Ford Taurus. Nope. Pre-Ford Taurus. Because why Ford Taurus is 86. You're in the right manufacturer. So an Escort? Nope. All right, you have to tell me then. So the first U.S. car to use composite headlights? Yep. Now, Europe's been using them for years. The 1984 Lincoln Mark 7. Okay, yeah. So luxury line. Yep. First of its kind. Um, and of course, when we say composite, this is what you think of when you think of a headlight today. So it, it's... Yeah, molded head- into the body. Yep. And you replace the element in the bat. You replace the element in the bat. So it's non-standard shape and they're aerodynamic. So we were talking about Monte Carlos just now and I was looking at those. So that's a 75 Monte Carlo. Mm-hmm. Still a huge car with two round headlights. And then they didn't change the car at all and the car was clearly designed around round headlights. Mm-hmm. So if you know, you're listening now and you can look it up, look it up as long as you're not driving. And in 76, that was the Monte Carlo. They stacked them. Oh, right. I remember that. Yeah. Really ugly. Yeah. <laughs> Just just to like 
be just, different. Yeah, just to fit the new rules. Like, oh, we can run square headlights. Guess what? We're gonna. Yeah, even though you could still run rounds, they weren't outlawed or anything. It was right. just, just to be different. Yeah, this is really ugly. Um, it's, it's a very similar look to like all of the 70s choppers they started doing. Yeah. The two square headlights on top of each other. Now, not all early composite headlights are plastic. Like, I have composite ones on my... I mean, it's a 99, the Montero, but mm-hmm. they're glass. The well, ones on my Galant are, too. Yeah, the the Galant, the 91 Galant has composite headlights, but they're glass. Well, the 92 was glass, and they're retrofitted. Nope, it's glass. Are they factory glass? Yep. Okay, are they retrofitted? Nope, it's glass. The, yeah, I have glass, I have glass the 93 has the weird clear ones without the flutes in it. That's what. That's why everybody likes them. Oh, okay. That's what yours has. Yeah, I have those ones. I knew, that. I knew mine were different. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, glass is cool because now, like, I think one of the things they didn't realize was UV damage. Yeah, the clear plastic doesn't stay clear for very long. Yeah. So they are, they're supposedly coated with a UV protectant, but if you never take care of your car, it well, just... the glass w- usually stays clear long enough for the warranty to expire. Yeah, um, the plastic. Yeah, the plastic, excuse me. The glass usually lasts for I'm a very long time. using glass as an interchangeable yeah. word here, and I probably shouldn't be. But the plastic lenses last not very long after yeah. the warranty wears out. Right. Or some, even if you're in a very sunny area, yeah, probably even less than fade out pretty quickly. And it's just like a coating that just wears off yep. from just getting grit blasted. There's a lot, of, the a lot of people don't wax, don't, they'll wax their car, but they don't think to wax the headlights either, which protects them for even longer. Mm-hmm. And then, of course... With all these changes in the laws, some of our favorite car designs came out in the 80s and 90s. Pop-ups. Yeah, but most pop-ups still used sealed beams. Right. And there's a reason why. Okay. They're also known as hideaway headlamps. Yeah. I've never really called them that, but I guess that makes more sense than pop-ups. So they were, pop-ups like a slang they term, They were right? more called hideaway headlamps when they first came out because they came out in like the 60s. And You I think they, they did. They definitely did. Mm. Oh, no, they came out in the 30s on a cord, mm-hmm. but they were they were popularized more in the 60s, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah, they came out in 36, I think, on the cord. Um, but the 60s, like the Riviera, had the clamshell ones, so the top and the bottom cover went, the top cover went up into the fender, and the bottom cover went down into the fender. Yeah. So those were hideaway headlamps. They didn't pop up, but they yeah. hid away. Or the 68 Charger they had flip the ones, over. They, the, the door flipped like into the grill. Or the 67, 68, 69 Camaro Rally Sports mm-hmm. had the door that flipped forward into the grill. So it didn't pop up. They just kind of... Or even the, the first Corvettes with hideaway headlights, they weren't pop-ups. They rotated all the way around. Mm-hmm. So like the headlights are facing backwards, and they do a 180-degree rotation to the front. Hmm. So. so the first car... Like you, you said with the high, uh, the style of hideaway headlamps, thirty six cord, thirty six cord, eight ten. Yeah. Also congruently, Alfa Romeo eight C, twenty nine hundred A, and the Ferrari Berlinetta. Mm. But these used a hand crank from the interior to open them. Yes. And then, interesting. I thought this was inter- really interesting because I think this is one of your favorite concept cars you've said before. Electric power hidden headlamps first appeared oh, on the, the Buick Y job. job, the Harley Earl car, yep. mm-hmm. which was like. Late 50s, I believe. I think it was early 50s. And the reason why you see a lot of pop-up headlights, though, on imported cars from the 80s and 90s was because it's super expensive design the, composite headlights. The Y job was 1938. Oh. It's a way forward-thinking design. Okay. I knew it was I knew it was really in the late 50s, but yeah, it's 1938, produced in 1940. Yeah. The cool thing with that, that concept car, that was 100% a real car. Yeah. And Harley Earl, the designer, head designer for GM, used to drive that car to work. Yeah. Like, he used to commute with. I mean, you get some pull like that when you're high up. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Especially in the 30s. Yeah. Um, so, it's super expensive to design composite headlights. And the U.S. still had laws about headlight height. And a lot of European and Japanese cars had lower suspension factory. Okay. And when they came here... They have to have higher suspension. So that's why people, a lot of people talk about with Porsches, either lowering the torsion bars to European height or other vehicles. I think Mercedes, people change out the springs, the Euro springs. Yep. So they sit lower, but they're still not like lowered. It's because there's like arbitrary laws about where US headlights have to be. So one of the ways they would get around with that, so like on something like the 8086, you could leave the suspension height unchanged if you added pop-ups because it would put the headlight higher on the body. Huh. It was a way to skirt it. I didn't know that. Yeah. I always thought it was a cool design, but that just, that, like, 
explains the difference between like the Japanese model A86 with yeah. the Levin headlights that weren't pop ups and yeah. the American one on the pop up headlights. Yeah. Huh. And I'm not sure if that was the way, the reason why the DSM cars were designed that way, or if it was purely for styling. It, beca- it became a, a styling thing in the yeah. 80s for sure. But I'm I'm sure, sure that the headlight height probably had to do, especially with a car like the well, NSX. Any car was, with a low with a low sleeping sweeping nose on it, like the DSM or the NSX or the Corvette or the Fire. Yeah, C4. Or yeah. yeah, C4 is a very low, much lower than a C3. So I wanted to give a quick piece of trivia in there. You're talking about headlights being um, mechanical versus electrically operated. Yeah. Do you know what the last vehicle to have mechanically like lever and crank versus electric was? No. No clues. Nope. Decades. Seventies. Opal, yeah. Opal GT. Oh. Yeah. The head, the head you had to are, hand crank them up? A hand crank is not the word I would use, but, but it was like a, a lever system. Through yeah. a lever? Yeah. Yeah. Weird. It was levers and rods. Weird. Yeah, it wasn't electric. But not even like having motors work those. You actually threw a lever. Yes. There's no motors involved at all. Huh. Interesting. And most cars that have pop-ups too, like if yours aren't working, mm-hmm. they have a, a little knob there that you can pull the cap off and crank them up. Yep. Yeah, because it... The end, the motor dies. In yeah. The, oh, the fuse dies, electric dies, whatever. You can manually crank them up. Yeah. So it takes forever, but you can do it. Yeah, I had to do it once. Yeah. So, um, and then I have like they also usually have a button that holds them up all the time. That's usually for cold climates, is what it's for. So they don't freeze shut. So you can park the car at night with the headlights up. And then it's nice because you can like wash your car and like clean them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a. Uh, a thing that we're both experienced with because we both use a daily drive car as a pop-up headlights. Yeah. So if it was going to snow out at night, we'd leave the headlights up at night. And that's what I liked about the um, the front of the Talon has the clear pass-throughs. Pass-throughs. So yeah. you could like high beam someone without the headlights coming up. Yep. A couple cars have that. Yeah. Um, the Miatas have that. Miata doesn't. It first, does. First-gen Miata does not. I could have sworn the light passed through that. Mm-mm. The, the, the headlight one. almost faces down on the ground. Really? It's down. Because the RX-7 has pass-throughs. Yeah. I think the Miata did too. No, those are just turn signals. Hmm. But those are also like that car has because it's got seven inch round headlights stuffed in there. Yeah. When it pops up, they're, they're like, like barn doors. Yeah, they're, they're huge. Yeah. yeah, they're huge. Which is part of the whole charm of the car. People say it looks happy with the headlights up. Yeah, and then like I mean, or maybe even a little derpy. Part of the reason why they kind of got rid of them was supposedly for. Aerodynamics. Simplification, weight, and aerodynamics. Yeah. I mean, are you really going to like how much you're saving like one mile per gallon at night? I enjoy driving first gen Miata with the headlights up. I like it. Uh, the other, uh, when we were going to Radwood in Vegas and I was riding with Ron and the Starion mm-hmm. and just sitting in the passenger seat, the headlights were popped up. I was like, and the all the gauges are the same colors of first gen DSM. I was like, yeah. oh, this feels very familiar. Yes. Like they're about at the same slope. And then you well, we've also s- spent a lot of time in the passenger seat of a Starian. Yeah. Quest anyway, for me. So, but it's like, I kind of like it. Cause when they're up, you see like the corner of the car at mm-hmm. night. It definitely demarks the corner of the car for sure. It, I don't know. It's pretty cool. And then just the movement of them going up. I don't know. I just like it. No, it's really neat. And it's, it's, it's satisfying when they both go up at the same speed. Yeah. It's not satisfying, like, in my father's Corvette, where I think they're vacuum operated. Mm. So, like, one of them's, like, almost all the way up, and the other one's, like, slowly catching up. It's kind of, like, <laughs> winking at you. So. I know. I spent a bunch of time. I remember when we first got my talent we were working on it. One of them was stuck one down. One of them was stuck down, yeah. And, like, I remember we, like, straightened it a little bit and then sprayed the crap out of it with PB Blaster. And I remember hitting it with a hammer, like, hitting the mechanism... And we like forced it, like we took the whole headlight out and we disconnected from the motor because the actual framework was jammed and we hit it and then we worked it back and forth. It started to get to move. Mm -hmm. It was like so satisfying. Then we got both of them to move and they both move like the still to this day, they move at basically the same rate, which is cool. But on that car, I've actually done the, that has the 200 millimeter squares. The Talon does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've done the same as the Conquest Narian. Yeah, I've actually done the Hella H4 conversion with it. So it's a permanent, almost like a s- composite style. Yeah, you can put the higher output H4 bulbs in the back of it. Right. And then it has a better... It actually... There's a lot of different versions of these conversions. Blah, that sounded weird. But the 
more expensive ones are the Hella ones with the actual glass lens. Mm-hmm. But in the recent years, there's like a lot of Chinese eBay ones that just yeah. have like plastic lenses. Skip over those. Yeah, they don't have like really good light output. They kind of like blast light everywhere. Yep. The ones that have like a projector in them, they're kind of weird looking. Those are the worst. Uh, you can get, they're very expensive. You can get nice looking LED ones and they'll have like flutes on them and they'll look basically like an original light. But you can also get really bad looking LED ones. Yeah. And it's like they can kind of ruin the look of an old car. I agree 100%. Like you're better off getting the more expensive ones or just getting a really high quality sealed beam. Well, what I like about the setup you have, the hell is, is that if you don't know, you don't know. Exactly. There's nothing visual about it when the when the headlight is off or even when it's on. Yeah. To somebody looking at the car to say that it's modified. Yeah. But they work so much better. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. What I like about that, like the whole seven inch headlight thing, what being part of the design of the car is just what you said before. You talked about like the seventy three Monte Carlo or the seventy Monte Carlo is this giant car and it has two round seven inch headlamps in the front of it. Mm-hmm. And then my seventy eight Colt is the same size car. Sorry, same size headlights. Yeah, in a tiny little car. Yeah, in a Miata. Yeah, first so Miata. it has these like super giant googly eyes in the front of it compared to a bigger car. So, do you know? All right, we're still we're gonna talk about pop ups real quick again. Do you know the last car to have pop up headlights? Well, I knew the last car to have mechanically actuated pop up headlights. There's uh, actually two cars. The last car to pop up headlights. So, Corvette went to ninety six. Firebird went to 99. You're about a decade off. Really? Yeah. C5 Corvette. Oh, the C5 had it. Yep. Oh, that's right, too. And Lotus Esprit. Okay. You know, I was funny because I was thinking of the end of the C the C4 into the C5, but I forgot the C5 still carried forward that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're talking 2005? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> And they're pretty much not allowed now due to, like, crash standards, right? For pedestrians, yeah. Yeah. Because you'll, like... Spear your leg. Yeah, I guess. I mean, just be careful crossing the street at night. Yeah, because that makes sense. Then the 05 and up NSX had the composites. Yep. The old flat composites, yeah. And then the C6 did, too. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, there's... I don't know how I missed that much. I was, like, a a whole generation off on the Corvette. Yeah. And even, like... I remember... Had they made the Esprit to 05? Yeah, I guess so. 04, wow. 05. Um, there was a bunch of late Ferraris, late 90s Ferraris that had pop-ups. Yeah, and the 348s and stuff. Yeah. Yep. And the... I don't know. 550s didn't, but the 4... 456 GT. 456 GT. The car that was before that. Yeah, the kind of not as exciting looking... Yeah. 550. I mean, it's really... Well, it was cool in period, but it hasn't aged very well. No, the it looks very much like a BMW 850. Yeah, yeah, it's not. They just kind of. I think the 348 aged better. It certainly did. Yeah, it's more traditional looking Ferrari, but the 550. 550 the looks really good. Gorgeous to this day. Yeah, it's weird how that happens, right? Yeah. You, is that? I guess does that come down to headlight design or the whole car is different? It's right? the whole car. Yeah. I, the whole car is different. I think a lot of it has to do with a car being designed for the period versus being designed. Um, as a car, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes cars are designed more to fit a period, and they you can tell later on. Whereas a good car design is, I don't want to say it's timeless because you can tell it's an old car, but it ages a lot better than. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at a nineteen. Go back to the Miata, the pop-up headlights. A first-gen Miata has aged really well, and they don't look like antique cars. You know, it doesn't. Other cars from nineteen ninety look a lot more like cars from nineteen ninety. Like you put like a nineteen ninety Camaro next to a nineteen ninety Miata, you know, they're very. Obviously, one's an older design. Yeah. I mean, they really knocked off a Lotus Elan, which was already a really good-looking car. Yeah. But, yeah, I guess for whatever reason, just the certain lines yeah, of a car. Some, some cars get dated faster than other ones. Yeah. I mean, maybe it didn't have the... I don't think the Miata had many of the hallmarks of the design of the times, whereas, like, a third-gen Camaro did. Yeah. And maybe that's why. It no. just, they went with more classic stuff versus... I know the 456 GT Ferrari is just kind of a underwhelming looking car. It's like uh, it's like having a pair of Chucks. They've been in style forever. Yeah. That even though it's the same design, it, they just... Right. Since the 50s, they're pretty much the same shoe. Right. And it kind of fits everywhere. Whereas if you go out with a pair of current 
Yeezys in 2025. Yeah. People are like, what the hell are those? Yeah. <laughs> or like uh, on the other, like a uh, Ray-Ban Wayfarers. Yep. They've looked the same since the 50s. Yeah, that's true. And they're just like classic. So I guess you just get away with certain designs. People get lucky with them. They just hit on a, a timeless classic. and Or just good design versus bad design. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so again, we're about to talk about you can retrofit older cars with conversions. Uh, there's a few good looking ones. There's like a ton of um, like they just don't work with HIDs and LEDs in them. No. Because they're too bright. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't have a lens design for them. Yeah, so like a brighter light needs a better focused beam. And well, you, it's, it's not even a brighter light; it's a different type of light output. Yeah, the way the, the way the light comes from the HID filament or the LED is different than how it comes from a halogen bulb. Yeah, an LED might not actually project out straight. Right, it's going to reflect off the sides, and it, it just totally depends on the the um, the way they go. Yeah, like and then just. In in closing about that, I think that the way to go is the hell of e-code conversion. Yeah. That's just the best way to do it. Yeah, because otherwise you just put them in and they just dazzle. Yeah. And they don't do anything for you. So like the Spaghetti Golf, somebody did uh, HID conversion to the 7-inch rounds on that thing. Yep. And they're replacing them they're, with just regular they're, they're ones. They're pretty garbage. And you couldn't see anything with them. You'd stand in front of the car and you get blinded and then you drive the car and you couldn't see anything. So. Yeah, I drove that car about 25 miles at nighttime and it was... Yeah. Tough to see. Stupid. I have a question. Yep. Did, in any of our research, because I didn't come up with it, was there a reason that some um, composite headlights were glass lens and some were plastic lens? Was that a regulation? Probably not a regulation, I don't think. It probably has to do with ease of creation. Because I know specifically, like, I used to have a 1987 Audi 4000, mm-hmm. and the U.S. market headlights were plastic and, car- and crappy. So the big thing to do was to get the European lenses, which were glass. Were they the same lens versus the same... It was a glass lens versus plastic lens. It was the same bulb in the back. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if there was a law for that. I didn't see anything about it. My only thought was maybe that, you know, a modern car with a really laid over headlight, that's going to be extremely difficult to do in glass yep. versus well, plastic. A 1987 Audi 4000, the very square headlights, very similar to the, like the Galant headlights I yeah. have that are glass. What's interesting is when you see like those seventies and eighties Mercedes mm-hmm. that have the Euro ones versus the yeah, it's a huge like rectangle like almost like loaf of bread shaped glass. Yeah. Whereas the American car has got obviously the seven inch rounds with this big like really shitty looking piece of not quite clear plastic around them. Yeah, yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, Euro Euro headlight conversions on Mercedes from the seventies and sixties are. And that's the crazy thing, right? Really like nice. you could. You can totally do it, and of then course. nobody nobody knows. Yeah, like, like nobody ever checks them at inspections. Nobody, nobody looks for your DOT numbers. No, I've only ever had DOT numbers come into question once on lighting in a car. Was it your 03 Evo? It was the Evo taillights. Yeah, yeah. which was so clearly that they came on the car because yes. they made like such a big deal out of it. It was all over the brochure. Right, but when I went to court to fight the ticket, I had yeah. to bring the brochure with me and a picture of my car to show that yeah. they were factory. So. But the, the officer was talking to them about being non-DOT when he pulled me over. And I was like, we can get out of the car and go look at them, and I can probably find a DOT number. Yeah. But he didn't want to do that. He just wanted to write me a ticket. So he wrote me a ticket. Yeah. And then what's an interesting, another interesting thing that I've, I've noticed between Euro and American cars is some will have amber taillights, some will have solid red for turn signals. Well, European cars all have amber. Yep. That's a rule in Europe. Yeah. It's not a rule here. Mm-hmm. So designers here would design the car with the American market in mind for all red taillight. And when they sell, sell them in Europe, they have to change to a yellow turn signal. Oh, that explains why a lot of Japanese cars just come with amber ones, so they don't have to design two taillights. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the law is in Japan about colored taillights, but I think they're all red there, too, is fine. So I'm thinking of some Japanese cars that have all red. Yeah, early cars, but, but I yeah, think most now come a lot with of amber. Europe, a lot of Europe requires an amber taillight, an amber turn signal. I actually prefer an amber turn signal mm-hmm. because it differentiates itself from the taillight better. I think so, too. I, I think it's a good idea. It's super weird, like, just all the little, like, weird little lighting laws. Quirks. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't think that it would be that big a deal, like, just design one lighting system. Well, I'm more than likely purchasing that European Eclipse. Um, yeah. And that has yellow turn signals because it's a European model. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I've seen people convert them. Yeah, yeah, well, this is an actual Euro car. 
Mm -hmm. It's a German market car. Weird. Doesn't have auto seat belts or super weird. Get turn signals in the Canada tires. didn't get auto seat belts either. Oh really? Yeah. Super hard to find that. Another stuff. stupid American rule. Mm hmm. But that was to get around um airbags. Yes. Because yeah, it was passive restraint or airbag. It's well, an airbag is a passive safety system. Okay, so it was passive restraint. So a passive so yeah. by not having to add airbags to your car, the way to put a passive safety system in is to have the seatbelt come up and over you because it I'm like happens every time you get in the car. Right. Which whatever. Most manufacturers didn't go that way other than Mitsubishi and Ford. Yeah. And Mazda? Did they? I think they did. I can't think of a car that had it. The RX-7 never did. I don't know. I don't know I for a Nissan, fact. I think Nissan did. I don't know for a fact. I know not not everybody did, though. Yeah. That's a whole... That could be a whole other yeah. episode. <laughs> Seatbelts. <laughs> Safety equipment in general. Um, And then... All right. So, like, did you... Um, all right. So, the trivia. What is the last vehicle to have sealed beam headlights? Well, I was, like I said earlier, I was thinking like an F-250, F or E-250 van, like some kind of commercial vehicle, like a work truck base package, probably still, or maybe up to the most recent redesign had that. 2017 Chevy Express. So close, the Chevy version of the Ford van. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then I was thinking about it, I was like, oh yeah, like they still just had those like seven inch sealed beams. No, they weren't seven inch, they were square. Oh, square, sorry. Yeah. Square um, sealed beams. And, I mean, there's some, like, obscure heavy trucks that still use them because it's whatever. It's just a truck. Probably not even. <laughs> yeah. But. I mean, even if you look at a lot of uh, commercial vehicles now, you can tell where the headlights and taillights came from because they're composite lights from a different vehicle. Yeah, like UPS like, trucks. UPS trucks have, like, an Oldsmobile headlight or something weird like yeah. that. And, like, campers and buses and, like, like a big tour bus usually has. Like a. A trailer taillight looks just like a Jeep taillight. Well, because they kind of are. Yeah. Like an earlier Jeep style taillight. But there's some of the motorhomes, the big, like 25, not big 25, but what do they go? 45 foot motorhomes that you can see the taillight is like just a taillight out of a, you know, Camry or something like that. Mm -hmm. So. You want to know, like, I mean, as far as modern lighting stuff in cars, I'm really not loving auto high beams. Nope. Really hate them or auto headlights in general. I don't mind auto headlights. So I don't know if they recently changed the law on this or not, but it used to be like your Evo, for instance. Speaking of cars getting pulled over, I got pulled over once driving your Evo because it had auto headlights, and my car didn't have auto headlights. The so car didn't have auto headlights. It had, it had, it had sorry, it had it has um, DRLs, DRLs, and the but the dash lights were on all the time. Yes. So when you turn the car on, the headlights came on. No, the and dash the lights come the on. Dash lights come on and the DRLs come on. Yeah. And if you're in a city situation, you don't really notice that's no you know what I mean? So I just drove the car away. Yeah. And I don't know if they changed that law or not now. You can't have the dash lights on with DRLs. I've anymore. noticed in some more some newer cars I've driven and I had rentals that now they have indicators that indicate that your lights are on on the dash. A light that comes on that tells you your lights are on. Okay. Which makes sense. So I still see a lot of cars going on the highway with no taillights. But they have DRLs on. Yeah, I think a lot of cars that were between like 12, 08 15, to yeah. like 15, yeah. Um, and then the other annoying thing, so like it didn't have auto headlights. It just had the DRLs. And then later cars didn't have any DRLs because the government was like, oh, DRLs aren't mandated. You guys don't have to run DRLs. Right, so they stopped. And they stopped running them yeah. because it uses up like 0.5 miles per gallon. 0.05 miles per gallon. Yeah. So yeah, any because you're just dragging down the electrical system by just running these lights all the time, and apparently it really didn't increase safety at all. It was just kind of silly. Yeah. Um, but I feel like I I have this conspiracy theory that there is some random internet post on Facebook somewhere that is telling people to drive around with their headlights on, their high beams on all the time. Yeah, probably. Is. Because it seems recently it's a more it's more epidemic. Way than it used more to be. common. Yeah. Or their brights, if you're not from here. Yeah. High beams, brights, whatever. Um, no, I've it, noticed it a lot more lately, too. Yeah. And then you, like, give them high beams, and they, like, just totally ignore you. Yep. Like, do you not get it? Like, Well, I remember pre-internet. I remember back in, like, the late 80s, early 90s, the rumor was not to flash your high beams at people. Yeah, why? 
well, it, used, it was like a, a sign of aggression, and it was like a gang sign, and people would like. I remember being told that it was like a gang thing if you flashed your headlights at somebody, and then they could sh- chase you down and like kill you. Sure. Yeah, that was like a pre-internet rumor. And then I remember being told that like, if you turned on your interior light while you're driving, you'd get like pulled over or something. Right, because you couldn't see anything. Yeah. Yeah. I remember being yelled at as a kid turning the interior light on. Yeah. We can't see. I want to crash the car. Like, but now I turn the interior light on when I'm driving, and I'm like, I think that was a line of bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah the, the the flashing high beams thing. I remember that was a a thing in like the late '80s, early '90s. I specifically remember like at a family dinner, my grandmother being concerned about it. Like, she, she yeah, read Weekly World News or something. But like the auto high beams are really annoying because if the scent, the car sense. I mean, they've been around a long time. Like again, it was like a Cadillac thing in the '60s. But if they if the sensor doesn't trip on the car that has them. By your headlights, mm-hmm. say if your headlights are like you're driving a, the lower, the Colt is like lower. Yeah, oh, and the headlights yeah, don't yeah. trip it, then you're just getting blasted in the face by high beams, and it stinks. So I just I just quickly googled um, headlight gang flash high beam gang sign. Yeah, and it comes up with an article. Yeah, uh, flashing headlight gang initiation. A warning about gang members driving around with their headlights off and then killing anyone who flashes them is very old and very false. Snopes. <laughs> but that's but that was. I, again, I remember that from that long ago. I mean, I've had... I remember I was in Boston in stop-and-go so, traffic, like at night, and I... I all right, go ahead. A print reference... A, a print references this gang initiation scare date to 1993 with anecdotal information as back as the early 80s. Huh. So that's that's what, that's what I remember hearing it. Like Weird. I'd never yeah. heard that before. Deep. So, deep. You know, I just remember it was like... I remember like being at my grandmother's house and like my grandmother and my aunt were like seriously concerned about it. Like we were all going to die if we flashed our high beams. <laughs> I mean, I've like, there was, I remember one time specifically I was in downtown Boston. I I think it was like, you know, summertime. So like some people had their windows down. I was next to this, I ended up next to this car at the light and they didn't have their lights on. And I like looked over. I'm like, Hey, your lights aren't on. And they're just both staring straight ahead passenger and driver they wouldn't look at me window up <laughs> i'm like i'm like i'm not being a crazy person right now i'm just i'm saying i'm just hey your headlights aren't on and they're just like mm, I don't, no i don't care in august of 93 a major outbreak of this scare swept the united states as legend spread quickly with the help of fax machines oh so it was like <laughs> so that, that's how that, that's how fake news was spread pre-facebook one of those junk fax machine like yes. things <laughs> that you'd still get like if you if you worked at a place like especially a parts department where had a fax machine for some inexplicable reason the in- early fears were further intensified when a new round of faxes went out a few weeks later these announcing a new blood initiation weekend of september 25th and 26th of that year <laughs> So yeah. Hey, remember all these organized street gangs? They went to a fax machine <laughs> and started faxing out <laughs> these warnings. Yes, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So uh, like I said, about '93. That's not. That's about when I remember hearing it. It's so late '80s, early '90s. That's a good one. I never heard that before. Yep. So that's the uh, that's a weird history of headlights in the U.S. Yeah, and headlights are now completely unregulated. It seems. Pretty As, much. Like, Audi has been like, oh, all these laws have expired. It's time to install the laser beams. Yeah. <laughs> so what are we doing now? Yeah. BMW, H- Audi, like they have like ridiculously bright headlights. Yeah. And they're literally lasers. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know how it works. It, it goes, the technology goes beyond anything I ever even care to know about. But they're, they've gone from incandescent bulbs to halogen bulbs to... HIDs. HIDs. Now it's LEDs. So now LEDs and now lasers. Oh, here's the other thing with LEDs. If you do an LED conversion, um, be careful in cold weather because... Yeah, they don't heat up as much. They don't... The bulb part doesn't heat up. Right. So you could actually end up with frosted over headlights. Yep. Now, it's a sort of a... They're like... You know, people are like, well, LEDs don't put in any heat. Well, they don't. But the circuitry that runs the LED puts out a bunch of heat. Yep. So in an actual factory LED headlight, like in a BMW, there's channels to make the heat. Well, there's actual the there's actually fans yeah. that circulate the air from the circuit board and into the headlight defrost the lens. Right. The other weird thing about LEDs is that some portions of um, people, like some percentage of people, yeah, see them flashing all the time. Oh, so it's super annoying to them. Yeah. 
Um, I've actually seen it. I don't know if it's because of the mirror in my vehicle or if it's because of my eyes and the way that this particular light hit that mirror. But there was a vehicle behind me that when I looked at the headlights by mirror, the headlights were flashing really fast. And I turned around and looked at it, and they weren't. Oh, see, I've seen it a couple times, but not in a mirror. But it was also a crappy-looking car with a crappy conversion, so I assumed the electrical system was not working right, and it's picking up... uh, Well, the way LEDs um, emit light is they pulse. Yeah. So some people can see that pulse, and it drives them freaking crazy. Well, you get a pulse through the alternator, and that's why you have a... a, um, uh, What is it called? You... Uh, it's not a capacitor. You have something in there. Oh my gosh, I can't think of it. In where? The voltage regulator? You have a, no, this part of the electrical system that dampens it so that it doesn't interfere with the radio. Oh, okay. So if that system is not working right and you've got these LEDs in there, they, they could be picking up the pulses from the alternator charging the battery okay. and then it's also going to make them flash. Maybe that was the case going on here, but I know it was super annoying. I didn't like it. And the other thing to remember when installing LED lights is if you're putting them in turn signals and stuff, you need to run... An LED flasher kind of, now. An LED flasher or, or, or some diode. kind of a diode or else they're going to flash. A resistor, fast. rather. Yep. Um, I usually only put them in now, like I buy the 194 LED peanut bulbs and I'll put them in. For like your interior lights and stuff? N- well, oh, for the like marker the plate, lights. Plate lights and marker lights? Yeah, because yeah, then you never really have to worry about them. Right. And then they and they draw like nothing. So otherwise, I still, I, I just use halogen, like a high quality halogen headlight because it just works. Mm-hmm. And you don't. Silver stars used to burn out a lot, but not anymore. No, they're better now. They seem to fix them. Yeah. I still have the turd signals that I, I put in the front of the town. They're those, like, they came out in the mid-2000s. They're, like, the clear silver stars. Mm-hmm. So, they're, like, a clear bulb, but they light up orange mm-hmm. or amber. Yeah, those are pretty. Because you can put them in a clear housing. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Uh, I don't think so. I think I'm good with headlights today. Yeah. It's kind of weird, right? All the little things you don't think of. Well, just like anything else, this government regulation has changed the way it's worked over the years, and that's yeah, you the me that car me- industry in general. You sent me that meme the other day, like, uh, you're worried about the government, think what they did to a gas can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but now you can actually, like, think about it when you go to a cruise night or something, all the cars have the same headlights. Yeah, you can literally interchange them from one car to the next, which is actually good when it comes to, like, vintage cars and availability of headlights. They'll be around for a long time. Yeah, there are millions of them. That's why I shows. said it was like really forward thinking for mm-hmm. the early forties. So to go right up to 2017, yeah, essentially with a van. Mm-hmm. I mean, they weren't the same round ones, but the same basic setup. All right, cool stuff. So as always, you can find us on Facebook, Auto Off Topic Podcast, Auto Off Topic on Instagram, Race and Anger on Instagram is me. Where can they find you, Brad? T S I S S three five zero. All right, cool. Keep your cars analog, your headlights halogen, and aim for the roses.